It will learn by listening and teach itself what is the norm in the location where it's being installed and educate itself. So it will know which drones to consider a threat and which drones to consider safe. You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 225. Is there a way to safely and legally take control of a rogue drone? One company believes they have the means to do just that. Soterius Caminas is the CEO and founder of Drone Defense Systems, a startup company that provides integrated drone detection and mitigation solutions to a variety of customers. Under a newly inked licensing agreement, the company received exclusive rights to commercialize an innovative counter-drone technology developed at Embry-Riddle University. The technology, developed by Embry-Riddle faculty member Dr. Hubin Song, suggests a safe, affordable way to neutralize rogue drones without having to shoot them down or force them to crash land, even in civilian settings such as outdoor entertainment areas or at airports. In this episode of the Drone Radio Show, Soterius talks about drone defense systems, the drone hijacking technology developed by Dr. Hubin Song, and how this technology could make the skies a whole lot safer. But before we hear from Soterius, I want to thank those of you who are supporting my funding campaign. Now you have the option of making a one-time donation in any amount by going to droneradioshow.com donate. Whether it's a dollar, $100, or much more, you can help defray the cost of production and keep the podcast going and growing. And if you'd like to make a monthly contribution, you can still go to patreon.com slash drone radio show. So let's learn how drones can be hijacked and diverted away from critical assets with Soterius Caminas of Drone Defense Systems. Let's pick up the interview where I asked Soterius to introduce himself. I'm Soterius George Caminas. I'm a businessman. I was raised in business. I'm 55 years old. And we have been running our family shipping business in Europe for the past 30 years. I decided at some point to relocate in the United States. And the major reason I decided to do that was because I want to dedicate my efforts into setting up an organization, a business that would address what drone defense does, which is uh, countering malicious usage of drones. So, Tirius, let's start by talking about the company. What is Drone Defense Systems? The amateur drones, as we know them today, I identified the threat those items can present if they're used by the wrong people for the wrong purpose. And the first thing that came to mind is to investigate what kinds of countermeasures are available for such a possible threat. So the first thing I did before the Drone Defense Systems was created, I spent a lot of time and money either getting access to the existing systems that would uh, actually uh, detect and stop drones. My conclusion was there wasn't anything that would do the job the way it should be done. So I decided to continue my testing. I acquired a lot of existing systems, different types of technologies, which I tested personally in different locations around the world. And I came to the business conclusion that there is a definite market for somebody with a vision in the industry of uh, detecting and encountering drones. So to make a long story short, I decided to start Drone Defense System as a U.S. startup company. I actually started the company inside an airplane flying over Europe. I did it online through LegalZoom, believe it or not. So when I landed in the U.S., the company was alive, kind of. When did you actually set the company up? That was in August of 2016. And you're located in Daytona Beach, Florida, near the Emory Riddle University. Why did you locate the company there? I was raised within Emory Riddle Aeronautical University. I came here as a student in the beginning of the 80s. I spent a lot of time in Daytona Beach going to college. And I actually, I had my first official or unofficial business as a, as a college kid. And here in Daytona Beach, I was putting together IBM-compatible computers and selling them to different small businesses around town. 
So I identified the Nembre Idle, very friendly environment, in an environment that I was uh, very accustomed to. I identified the threat that drones pose to aviation. So I already had a house in Daytona Beach. You know, every item on the checklist was checked okay. So I decided to further my cooperation or my alliance with Ember Riddle by having the company here in Volusia County, Daytona Beach, Florida. What were your first steps in getting things moving? The first step is to, to conclude the vision that I had to have a comprehensive technology and system that could accurately detect and stop drones, no matter what. No matter what their origin, the manufacturer, the, the method of operation. So I had already established partnerships with different technical centers and I used by the engineers we already had in our maritime business, electronic engineers and mechanical engineers as, as my consultants. I utilized existing resources and by utilizing those resources, I put together the first RF jamming system that we developed December of 2016. But the RF jamming technology isn't legal for civilian use, right? That is correct, yes. So then what did you use it for? It was used for testing purposes. We have done tests done in South America, in Iraq, actually, adding more channels in order to counter drones that have been tampered with. The same way ID devices are being triggered in, in Iraq. You know, those guys change frequencies all the time. So anyway, we reached the development point where a very cost-efficient RF jamming device would be or is available to the drone market. Of course, it was illegal and of course it couldn't be sold, but my intention was not to commercially start selling equipment. My intention was to be able to, as I said, to visualize a complete system that would be able to detect and stop any drone. How did you transition to a system that could be used commercially? While this process was ongoing, I planted the seed of developing a system that actually would be able to be used in a civilian environment because the drone defense market is segregated with civilian and non-civilian markets. So the civilian market is the one that impacts people the most and also impacts legitimate users of drones. So uh, to make a long story short, and with the help of uh, specific professors within the uh, university environment, I was introduced to the team that eventually developed a very efficient, financially efficient and technically superior system that actually hijacks a drone without being intrusive to anything around it. And that's where we are today. Tell us about the system. How does it work? My outlook for the final product, which of course is dynamic. You can never conclude and say, okay, this is it, because the technology always changes, the threat changes, and so the counter technology should change as well. But the principle is that we have a layered system that creates a dome of protection over every target. We call this a dome shield. The first layer of protection is the non-intrusive system, the one that we developed with Ember Riddle. And the second layer is the RF jamming. And the third layer is electromagnetic pulse. And we have all these three technologies right now. So the system in its civilian version, the way the legal framework is today, is limited to the technology that we call the drone jacker. And uh, nothing else can be used in a civilian environment for reasons that you know better than I do. The interference of an RF jammer to Wi-Fi communication, even GPS communication, is uh, evident and is dangerous, especially in aviation. So for the civilian market, that system is uh, the best solution today. And with version 2.0, is already on the, on the drawing board, and we're working on it. That doesn't mean, of course, that the first system won't be commercialized. It will be commercialized, but it will be an open architecture system that will be able to be combined with several detection devices, the sensors and other technologies, because there's no such thing as a unique or the best drone detection system. Depending on the application, the system needs to be flexible and has to be configured to fit the purpose. So uh, this is the, the configuration as it will evolve. We expect and we will develop the system that we have the commercial agreement with Embryl into two layers. The first will be the detection and the second will be the, the countermeasures. And as I said, those systems will be made available to other partners in the industry, and we welcome such opportunities. Can you talk more about this two-part system, especially the part about the countermeasures? The first portion is to detect, categorize, identify the drone. This can be done with a system that we have now in our hands through Embryl, but also our, our system is open to accept any other input from other detection systems. So yes, the first step is to identify, and the second part is to emulate the language, the way the drone operates and is being guided, 
and snatch the control from any operator and guide it in a safe location. Now, in those safe locations, for example, in the case of an airport, would be two predetermined points away from the runway with specific uh, longitude and latitudes. How far along are you with developing the system? The system is being built now. The construction of the prototype is starting next week, and it will be concluded before the end of the year. And uh, believe it or not, thank God, we have secured the first paid pilot installation and with the blessings of the federal government. Before the end of the year, we'll have the system functioning. But as I said, in the meantime, we are working on the drawing board in the upgrade of that system. This is the first layer of protection, ideal for any civilian location, and also will be the first layer of protection for military installations and installations outside the United States not falling under the legal uh, restrictions that we have in a civilian environment. And of course, you're able to add other measures for military installations, like the drone jamming technology. Definitely, definitely, definitely. If we could visualize it, it might sound a little bit peculiar, but the same way Star Trek, you know, uh, Captain Kirk would order Sulu to raise the seals. Imagine an invisible dome of protection over every target. The first test that we did in testing our capacity to engineer such a system is utilizing RF jamming was a military installation overseas of an area of 11.2 square miles. So imagine that we managed to create an engineering system that when installed, it would completely shield 11.2 square miles from any drone incoming drone. Because you know what? What you've seen and what I've seen is people trying to test like drone guns or whatever on single drones approaching the threat is not going to be one drone by itself. It's going to be 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 drones. Our system is able to address unlimited number of drones at the same time and protect the target in its full deployment status, as it would be in a military installation. But the civilian installations come first. So we're at the right place at the right time right now. When it's deployed, what will the client need to man or operate the system? The system will be unmanned, running it by itself. One of the biggest threats that we have, and you know that, is uh, AI-driven drones where they can make decisions on their own, a swarm of drones attacking a specific target. So the evolution of the system, the way it is being designed and tested, utilize artificial intelligence to fight not only uh, simple drones, but artificial intelligence guided drones. So the system by itself will be installed. It will learn. It will teach itself by listening. And by listening, I mean not only acoustic, but listening to RF frequencies in the area where it is located and teach itself what is the norm in the location where it's being installed and educate itself. So it will know which drones to consider a threat and which drones to categorize as safe. It's very important to allow this booming business to flourish. There's a lot of people that make their living out of utilizing drones today. And those people should not suffer the lack of regulation, I might say, or the lack of proper technology to secure civilian targets. And that's our biggest priority right now, to have a transparent system that will do the job of protecting civilians and any asset without interfering with the normal operation of uh, legitimate people and companies. What do you say to people who say that this is all too good to be true? Uh, we have the three biggest technologies that can do this and counter drone technology, the non-intrusive, the drone jacket, the RF jamming, the way you have developed it at a very, very, very attractive commercial profile. And of course, the last defense against drones, which is electromagnetic faults, high power electromagnetics that will actually fry the electronics indiscriminately and will stop anything, will drop it out of the sky. This is not something new as far as RF and uh, electromagnetic pulse. The point is that when I was investigating the market, I did find systems that do exactly that. But there are millions of dollars. I mean, the military already uses this kind of systems. We managed to downsize the technology or redesign the technology from the bottom up. So as a company, we're positioned in a place where we want to be attractive partners for smaller companies to work with us and use our technology or us using their technology as, as far as detection sensors, etc. But also we want to position ourselves in a position that the big guys, the big names, you know, in the defense market can look at us as a viable alternative compared with what they would have to spend if they were to redesign or downscale their existing multi-million dollar technologies for this market. 
I believe we're at the right place at the right time. I spent the last six years of my life in this, and I'm very happy I did that because I've learned a lot. And I've learned a lot not only from the technical point of view, but also running a startup because, you know, I'm not a spring chicken by, by no means, but running a startup in the U.S. was a very, very important issue for me. So let's talk about running a startup. What was it like for you going from running a large shipping company to creating a startup? It is a whole different culture. Startup companies are not companies per se. It's a, it's a culture, and you have to introduce yourself and accept this culture. For somebody uh, that is seasoned in business, I had to make a big decision, and the decision is that I cannot forget everything I know about running a corporation in the standard way and start with a clean slate and educate myself. And to that, I have to thank my son, who was born and lives in the United States and worked for a company called Techstars in New York. And his job was in the startup business. He was the one that was taking companies and build them up and made them visible to VCs so they are acquired. So he was the one, he was my teacher. I had my son, which is like 20 years younger than me, teach me. And you know what? I'm happy and, and proud of myself, not of any, any success I've had in my life, but to my ability to adapt, overcome, and improvise, as the Marines say, and become a student. They say you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. Well, I'm living proof that this is not correct. I'll learn from scratch. I'm running, you know, 30-hour days, and I'm enjoying it. It is tough. It is excruciating, you know, pitching for the company to people that have the money. But you know what? I wouldn't change anything. It's unbelievable how this culture evolved in the United States, uh, starting from uh, Silicon Valley and evolving in New York, where I think it's thriving today. Based on what you've learned, what advice would you give to other entrepreneurs? My advice is have a vision. Have a clear vision where you want to go and never lose sight of that vision. It is very, very important. Having a startup secures one thing. It's hard, extremely hard. And you can fail and people fail but secures for the entrepreneur, for the guy starting the business, or the lady that's starting the business. Having a startup is a, you're working without debt. It's a method of operation that will allow you to raise funds from angel investors and people that know what the startup is and they're willing to take the risk. My other advice is focus. I said before, have a vision and focus. Never lose sight of where you want to go. There are adversities in life, there are adversities in business, but you have to follow the approach which I call Krav Maga. Krav Maga is a martial art that the Israelis have invented and they're using. And if you Google it, you'll see what I mean. I mean, you walk through the city and you need to cross the city and get to the other side. And no matter who hits you, who punches you, who stabs you, you keep on moving forward. It might sound grotesque or gross or whatever you want to call it. But you know what? This is the primary element of success. Imagine, visualize the big picture. Know where you want to go. Identify the assets that you need in order to succeed and never lose sight of your target. Move towards no matter what and never look back. So what's next for drone defense systems? Well, drone defense systems, LSE, is still in its seed round phase. Uh, we will complete our seed round. So me pitching for the company and bringing more investors on board is important. But at the same time, we are proceeding with the further development of the existing technology as far as a drone jacket is concerned and moving ahead with the paid pilot installations to in order to materialize them and introduce them to the market and mainly to the regulatory bodies. We are in contact with the government, the US government. Actually, they, they came to us. We are working with the FAA and we have some guidelines from the FAA on how to move ahead. So our plan is to have the system we including the control and command portion of the system readily available to be demonstrated and invite other companies to participate. In this market, there should be synergies. I cannot understand if you know people that might proclaim that they have the best technology. Well, yes, you might have the best technology, but for how long? Teamwork is important. People who need to share commercial interests, they need to share visions, and I believe that Entities that can share common visions eventually will partner also in the commercial uh, sector. So in the next six months, you should expect us to produce uh, uh, installed systems and demonstrate them as far as the non-intrusive technology, the drone jacker. The military technology is there and it's being scrutinized now by the government. And it's always available for use whenever the legal framework allows it. If I may say so, eventually, eventually, 
the government will have to understand that they need to allow some form of interference from counter drone systems in order to protect life and property. Although our system, for example, we can program frequencies that will not jam, so ground crews can use the walkie-talkies or Wi-Fi networks can still operate, still in an open-air venue, like you know, like a like a Super Bowl or something like that. Any technology, our technology, would be able to identify and drive the drones away from the target in a safe area where they can be acquired by law enforcement. Still, we need to have the legal framework that would allow, as a last resort, the use of intrusive technology in order to protect life and property. Unfortunately, and I say that with full understanding of what I'm doing and what I'm saying, I have identified that sometimes they wait for the for the bad thing to happen before anybody reacts. So I don't believe in being reactive. I believe in being proactive. But you know what? I don't make the laws. So I have to comply with what the legal framework we have to work today. And as it stands, we comply with it. But as I told before, at the end of the day, the perfect counter drone system will include some kind of an, of an intrusive technology. There's no way around it. You've mentioned a couple of times about having a paid pilot for the project. A lot of startups aren't lucky enough to have a customer or a potential customer willing to invest in a demonstration. How significant is this and what does it mean to the company? It is very significant because it creates, it creates a milestone for us. As a company, as a startup company, it's a milestone for us. It's something that will raise our value and will attract more investors and will move us ahead. Most definitely, practically, for the world, for the, for the market and the people, it will show and prove to people how this technology work and will give us and our partners the opportunity to troubleshoot, see you know what areas need to be improved. So it's really, really important. Any way you look at it, it's really important for the regulatory bodies, for the customer, for us, and for the ordinary civilian or the guy that makes a living using drone technology. I find the relationship between drone defense systems and Embry-Riddle University very interesting. The technology is actually developed by Embry-Riddle and licensed through drone defense systems. So can you talk about the partnership? Embry-Riddle to us is a, is a home, away from home. My home is like two miles away from the school. My office is four miles away from the school. I'm sure other universities do it, but my experience with Embry-Riddle has shown that apart from being an academic leader, they also have a grasp of business. And this is very, very important. Because all the research that's been done, I mean, this is funded research. This is research that makes money for the university. And the, the licensing agreement that we have with the university for this exclusive technology, it will bring money to the university as well. So what is important to state is that we see academic institutions being transitioned from the pure geeky type thing, you know, like, you know, guys with thick glasses doing research and building stuff to actually a platform to transition to the open market. And embry is a good example of that. They have done a very good job and made my life a easier trying to draft the legal agreements with them and negotiate and end up with this beautiful commercialization exclusive agreement. We need to say that. It's a thumbs up for the school. And uh, you know what? I will keep on working with them no matter what. They have offered invaluable experiences for us and invaluable services regardless of financial compensation. And my final question, Soterius, what message would you like to leave listeners about drone defense systems, its counter drone technology, and what it means to the overall drone industry? Any business, in my eyes, and with my experience, should start with a vision. And my vision is to have a system that is an open architecture system utilizing artificial intelligence that can speak, can cooperate, can accept any kind of input from other systems that other people make, other companies make, and be able to do what it's supposed to do, stop any drone threat. What it means for the general public is a peace of mind. And that's my message. It's peace of mind, whether this is an airport, whether the technology is applied in an airport or a power plant or an outdoor venue or anywhere. The threat will be identified and exterminated without people knowing anything about it. It will be transparent. And this is very, very, very important. That's it for episode 225 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Soterius Caminas of Drone Defense Systems. I want to thank Soterius for taking the time to speak with me. 
If you want to learn more about drone defense systems and its countermeasures, or want to connect with Soturias, check out the webpage at dronedefense.com. If you'd like to contact Dr. Hobring Song, go to the MB Riddle webpage at erau.edu. If you like the Drone Radio Show, please consider supporting the podcast with a small donation. The content is always free, but for as little as $1, you can help defray the cost of production. To donate, go to droneradioshow.com slash donate or patreon.com slash show. Thanks for listening. Your support means a lot to me, and I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Goers. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels. Thank you.